All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? People can hop on as they uh, can. Well, welcome everybody to our next installment of um, Boston Lymphatic Center webinar for lymphatic therapists. Um, it's great to have those that have joined and hopefully a few more hop on. Today, we're gonna uh, have Emily uh, Muller and Kathy Shalou discuss their recent experience at the International Society of Lymphology World Congress, which was in Italy um, about a month ago. Uh, so they're gonna talk about what they presented to the world and then what they learned from the Congress as well uh, to share with you that, that weren't able to make it. So Emily and Kathy, thanks again for your time and look forward to hearing uh, what you guys learned. Great, thank you, Britt. Um, so I, I really feel like we were really privileged to go with a group. We had 10 people from our team here at the Boston Lymphatic Center travel over to the World Congress and uh, you know, between the 10 of us, we had 14 presentations. So um, it was really kind of um, very exciting and also um, nice to be able to hear perspectives from around the world. Um, it, was, it was held in Genoa, Italy. Um, so it was nice um, when the end of the day after the conference to go out and explore Genoa, it's a really nice place to go. Um, the, the ISL holds their meeting every other year. Um, and this year was the first time since the pandemic that they held it in person. So um, good representation from really most of the European countries, but also from um, Turkey, um, Russia, um, Asian countries, as well as South America and the US. So I thought what we would do is present first um, two of the presentations that we presented, Emily and I, uh, because they're more in the realm of lymphedema therapy. Um, and they might be more interesting to lymphedema therapists. And then um, then we would also kind of share our perspective on, on the themes that we really um, saw at the conference. So the first um, presentation that we did, um, that, I, that uh, we did for um, lymphedema therapy was looking at the effect of time and compression, uh, wearing compression garments on the quality of life in patients with lymphedema. And um, we have no, 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 no disclosures to report. Um, what I'll do is give you a background, um, what we identified as the problem, what we did to study this, and then some conclusions from that. Um, we know that compression is really the mainstay of our treatment for patients with lymphedema, not only in the decongestive phase, but also in the maintenance phase. It's really what the patients are gonna spend the bulk of their time doing. And also quality of life is such an important outcome measure for us to be understanding the impact of the disease and also to measure for our outcomes. And we've noticed that when patients come in, one of their goals is always to reduce the amount of time in compression. Nobody likes wearing compression, although they recognize its value in treatment and keeping their edema under control. Um, but because they often express a desire to not have to wear so much compression, it would be important for us to think of that, especially in relationship to the quality of their life. So the problem is when we looked into the literature, there really is a lack of standardization in the reporting um, of the type and the amount of compression um, in the outcomes for treatment for lymphedema and a lack of data showing the relationship of quality of life to um, the compression for patients with lymphedema. So our research question was, how does the amount of time and compression affect quality of life in patients with lymphedema? What we did is go back and do a retrospective review of patients seen between 2017 and 2022. So from that, we had just under 4,000 entries and we had to exclude um, patients who had multiple entries or patients who had missing or incomplete data. So that left us really with about 577 individual patients that we looked at. And it broke down to 194 with lymphedema of the upper extremity and 383 with lymphedema of the lower extremity. We looked at the LymphQL survey, which is one of the standard measurements that we use, which is a patient um, filled out survey. It has um, scoring of one to four points and in each of the subscales of symptoms, appearance, mood, and function. And then we looked at number of hours in compression. And this is one of the standard measurements that we use for all patients. We ask them how many hours they're wearing the compression per day and, and calculate how much that translates out to per week. So 186, 168 hours a week would be maximum. Somebody wearing compression all day and all night, really just removing it for um, bathing and hygiene. And zero would be not wearing compression at all. 
asking. And we looked at all of this data, there was a really wide variation. A lot of people were at the two extremes. Uh, we had a lot of people in the mid range and to really make it easier for us to understand, we separated them out into different categories. So anybody that was wearing compression 12 or more hours a day, we put them into the category of basically day and night, they were in compression, um, daytime and some nighttime hours. Um, somebody who was wearing compression for six or more hours per day, every day, um, we put them into the category of daily compression. Uh, people who are wearing compression intermittently, not on a regular basis or less than six hours a day. And then patients who were wearing no compression or were compression free zero hours a day. And you'll see how that breaks down when we looked at the data. Okay. So these are the, the four categories and you can see that the darker blue um, are patients with upper extremity lymphedema and the turquoise are the patients with lower extremity lymphedema. So more of our patients with upper extremity lymphedema, interestingly, were in compression um, for greater than 84 hours or what we would consider day and night compression, but otherwise we're fairly even comparison. So when we looked at the, the data, um, analyze the compression versus quality of life, um, we really only noticed a significant difference in the functional subscale on the quality of life measurement for patients. Um, and if we looked at the data even further, really the only significant difference was between patients wearing compression between, or what we would consider intermittently, one to 42 hours a week and 42 to 84 daily um, compression hours per week. And patients who are wearing their compression daily versus patients who are wearing compression day and night but nothing consistent over across all of the um, categories. And then for patients with lower extremity lymphedema wearing compression, again, we found the only significant difference was in the subscale of function. And again, when we really took a deeper dive and looked at um, the data further, it was really only in the subscales of patients wearing no compression versus patients that were wearing compression all day or patients wearing no compression and patients wearing compression day and night, which kind of may intuitively made some sense to me when I listened to patients and how much they don't like wearing their compression, somebody who's wearing no compression at all versus day and night, we would expect to see a little bit more of a, a difference in function perhaps. So we saw that there were significant differences in arm and leg function subscores when comparing hours in compression but no decrease in functional subscores with increasing hours of compression for patients in the upper extremity. Um, and from that, we really realized that this is our first dive into all of this data. Compression time is really only one of the factors in a patient's compression regimen. So many other components play into it, the type of garment, the weave of the garment, um, the material, the class of compression, the fit, how comfortable it is for the patient, how often they were placing the garments, and perhaps more than any other, uh, the cost to the patient. Um, it, that really oftentimes dictates what kind of compression they're going to wear. So really what that um, caused us to reflect on how we're documenting compression. And one of the, the next steps, the key steps, was that we want to be able to compare hours in compression versus quality of life in some of the other subcategories of our patients. Um, patients who are um, having debulking surgery versus post-debulking versus uh, pre-lymph node transplant versus post-lymph node transplant and drill down a little bit uh, further. Um, and in addition to that, we realize that we really have to start recording a little bit more um, standardized methodology in um, the type of garments that patients are wearing, either flat nurses versus circular knit, the type of garment that they're wearing, um, the class of compression and perhaps even the layers of garments, because oftentimes after surgery, we have patients wear, um, you know, a waist high with a thigh high on top of it. So all of those elements really would matter in making sense of the data. Um, so our next step, really what we have done, we came back and um, reprogrammed our REDCap database, which is where we put all of our data for um, patient measurements. And hopefully we'll be able to drill down a little bit more specifically the next time we take a look at the data and figure out really what all this means. So I'm gonna turn it over to Emily and have her um, give you a synopsis of what she presented. And then after that, we will talk about some of the other themes that we, from presentations that we went to.
Okay. <clears throat> so as uh, as Brett kind of, I think he might have given a quick highlight, but um, basically the the topic I focused on is um, defining lymphatic, well, not defining, but kind of emphasizing lymphatic uh, therapy's role in optimizing edema control before lymphatic surgery. And going a little deeper into that, <clears throat> highlighting the difference between what a baseline and a preoperative measurement is and, and why that's important. So um, part of uh, the role of the lymphatic therapist, obviously, is to conservatively manage these patients, regardless of whether or not they're um, going on to have a surgical intervention. Um, but to focus on the surgical side, we wanna make sure that our patients are ready for surgery. And we look for, um, we look for uh, minimization of pitting edema, kind of stabilization and less fluctuation in the amount of, um, and the severity of their symptoms throughout the course of the day, et cetera. And we do this obviously um, through a few different modes. Um, we might decide to do a course of complete decongestive therapy. We might uh, change up the mode of compression or increase their time in compression. We may um, kind of help them to devise a game plan for weight loss um, to help uh, with lymphatic flow as well. And basically, um, for the purposes of this discussion, I kind of want to focus on what the difference is between a baseline or initial set of measurements and a preoperative me measurement, because that will really highlight the role of therapy and why it's important. So the baseline measurement or the initial measurement is obviously when they walk through our doors for the first time, where are they at now? Versus we then kind of help them to, to change up their routine to kind of optimize them. And then we'll have a final pre-op measurement before they go on to have their surgical intervention. So that's kind of that chunk between those two measurements is kind of the meat and potatoes for us as therapists. <clears throat> so the problem number one is basically that there's a, uh, through the research or through our kind of review of the available literature, it doesn't seem like there's a lot in the way of standardization of how these surgical outcomes are reported. And secondarily, the reported outcomes often highlight the impact of the surgical intervention and kind of underrepresent the uh, the impact of the conservative intervention. Essentially, if one center is reporting on their baseline or initial measurements as they compare to the post-op measurements, that's going to look a lot different from somebody or a center who is reporting on their initial measurement or the baseline measurement, and then the preoperative measurement, and then of course the post-op follow-up measurements. So what did we do? We looked at um, patients who underwent surgical debulking procedures or a vascularized lymph node transplant as their first or initial surgical intervention. Um, some of the times uh, at our center, patients undergo stage procedures, so they'll have one procedure and then the other. Um, so we just looked at patients' very first intervention with us. And we looked at um, changes in limb volume using either pyrometry or using a truncated cone measurement um, after uh, measuring their circumferential measurements. Um, we looked at bioimpedance uh, or LDEX scores using our SOZO machine. And um, some of what Kathy highlighted, uh, we use our, the lymphedema quality of life uh, tool to measure their quality of life scores. <clears throat> So um, we looked at 103 patients um, and we found that by reviewing our kind of data, we found that 56% of them were already optimized at time of evaluation while leaving, you know, 44% who needed a little bit more intervention before they were quote unquote ready for, for surgery. We're looking again for optimization to be minim minimization of hitting edema, um, kind of stabilization of day-to-day -day symptoms and limb volume, things like that. And kind of a good, uh, a good uh, adherence to a day-to-day -day regimen for self-management. All right, so we had 33 patients within our cohort who had bioimpedance measurements that were able to be tracked at each visit. Um, and again, we use the bioimpedance or the LDEX score to represent how congested the tissue is with extracellular fluid. A lower LDEX will, will correlate to um, better control of edema. So nearly three quarters of the patients who received additional therapies prior to their surgical date demonstrated improvement 
which is again shown by a decrease in this LDEX score. And we had 23 patients who had consistent and trackable limb volume. And again, that's either by pyrometry or by the truncated cone uh, volume measurement. Um, and 70% of those patients demonstrated improvement of limb volume after the therapeutic intervention by their CLTs. Again, whether that be a course of CBT, just changing up their garments, time and compression, exercise recommendations, et cetera. We were able to identify 19 patients with trackable limb, uh, lymphedema quality of life scores between initial and pre-op visits, and we grouped these patients by affected limb, upper or lower extremity. And we tracked the average changes in overall and then the subset scores of the lymph QOL, and we found no real clear trends overall. Many of the subsets of the quality of life tool were demonstrated to have been improved after intervention by the therapy team, most likely or most notably the um, symptom uh, subset and the, the um, sorry, the symptomatic and the functional subsets. <clears throat> so those small, our data set shows the benefit of uh, identifying the preoperative optimization of the lymphatic patients um, with conservative management. By reporting on both the baseline and the preoperative measurements, there's a twofold benefit. Um, one is we're creating a level playing field when it comes to the literature and how it's all represented and how different centers are looking at, at, the, at the data. Um, but it also really truly highlights the, the value and the benefit of having um, the lymphatic therapy team on board with these cases preoperatively. And that's a little picture of us when we were in Jetawa. Okay, so I'll bring kind of Kathy back into the picture here. Um, we're just going to briefly chat. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so we figured we wanted to leave a few minutes for discussion or questions, but um, Kathy and I wanted to, obviously we were there to present, but we are also there to learn, so we want to make sure that we're touching on some of the interesting things that we saw um, in different presentations from from other places around the world. So um, one of the things that that I saw and kind of clung to, and it was in multiple presentations, um, is intervention by therapists that included the use of pneumatic pumps, but kind of in a different way than is typically prescribed, um, at least here. Um, and that is with the uh, kind of concurrent use of a textured layer of foam or even a night garment underneath the pneumatic pump. Um, and the thought there is that you're getting some texture to kind of dig at or soft it, soften some of the more fibrotic or more congested or thickened skin. Um, and that really um, has been found to have a, a greater impact on limb volume in, improvement um, and skin quality and, and uh, just an overall decongestive benefit. I had learned about using night garments underneath a pump in the past, but it was actually really interesting. There were at least a couple of presentations that included this as like a mainstay of their treatment. And there was actually, I think one study that they actually did mostly passive. Um, they did like passive um, range of motion and things like that as part of their, their treatment, which I'm not sure if we wanna go there or not right now, but um, this was like, I think the big, the big money maker for for that study is this the introduction of uh, texture underneath the pneumatic pump and um, and I think multiple times per day I think they did it um, for a fairly significant amount of time um, but we have since used that in the clinic as well and some patients find it really beneficial um, so that was something that that I really gleaned from this is kind of having the evidence to support it because again I'd heard about it before but this is kind of cool to see um, the actual the numbers come out of it and how beneficial it is. Yeah, I also think that it's that, you know if you're you're working on somebody who has a lot of dense fibrotic tissue sometimes kind of softening them up with the uh, texture layer in the pump first 
makes it easier then for you to go in and do your manual lymphatic drainage and then you can have a little bit more of an effect. So using it in that, right, you kind of pull out when you have something particularly difficult, you pull out all of your tools. But it was particularly surprising to see so many centers from so many places around the world using it in a really standardized way enough that they could gather some data. So that was one take home. Yeah, yeah. And then the other take home was exercise. So many people doing um, studies on the effect of, of exercise and exercise is one of the components of CDT. So it's it's usually something that we're using with all patients, but really um, many centers, um, Spain, Turkey, Russia, um, um, someplace in, in, I don't know if it was Thailand or Taiwan um, and in South America using different forms of exercise. Pilates, a couple of presentations on the use of Pilates, but also resistive exercises, weightlifting exercises, some heavy duty um, resistive exercises um, in combination with other, you know, CDT methods um, for keeping edema under control, showing some very good success. And the reason it stuck out in my mind and I went to see these presentations was because we have noticed the same thing postoperatively after lymph node transplants, for example, um, we've noticed improvement in the patients who are doing weightlifting exercises or resistive exercises. Um, you know, we tend to give exercises to all of our patients, but really recognizing the um, importance of the intensity of exercise. And if we're really working hard enough to build muscle, that seems to have um, a little bit anecdotally in our case, more of an impact um, on their edema control. And so before we had gone to Italy, we had started doing it as part of our standard routine, giving a, a strengthening exercise program to all of the patients postoperatively by that six week visit, getting them started if they weren't already doing something um, strengthening wise, getting them started on a strengthening program. So it was surprising to see so many places around the world also doing consistent exercises. So I think those are the two highlights as far as um, lymphatic therapy um, go. I don't, you know, I don't know if you, anybody has any questions or comments about what people are using out there, whether they're seeing similar trends or the utility of using exercise. I'm not exactly sure how to do this best, but if anyone has any questions or comments, <clears throat> you're welcome to raise your hand on there and I can allow you <laughs> to uh, to chat or ask a question here. Like everyone's. So I, I guess maybe I'll tell you what we're, we started doing as a, um, a, a um, protocol for our post-op patients, um, giving them, if somebody was not already using um, any kind of exercise, resistive exercises post-operatively, we'd start them on a program. Um, I'm using just either um, TheraBand exercises and just using a standard, you know, um, bench press, overhead press, pull down, triceps, biceps, wrist exercises, um, a series of exercises to address all of the upper extremity muscles um, for a set and having them doing it um, on a regular basis and tracking them. If patients were already doing some kind of exercise, then we would work with whatever their gym program was or their weight, weight program at home and design a, an exercise program using those um, and get them started back on their exercise program by the six week visit when they come back. At three weeks um, after lymph node transplant, we would start them on doing more of an active exercise, um, kind of mimicking the same movements, but then tr you know transitioning back into strengthening exercises. And then encouraging the same thing for um, our patients postoperatively after debulking surgery. Um, having more of a, I think we probably focus more on the overall balance of exercises, doing you know 150 minutes of exercise with a combination of aerobic and strengthening exercises, um, but we've really shifted gears um, and not shifted gears so much, but really focusing more on the strengthening exercises. So I think that's another thing that what we did was reprogrammed our REDCap database so that it's going to allow us to collect more more specific information about the type of exercise, intensity, um, um, type of exercise, and frequency and duration. So we get information on both the compression and the exercise, more information about the dose um, to see and track and see how that plays into overall control of what we're doing. To, and with the tracking and, and database kind of data collection stuff, we're also now adding, because of your study, adding more about specifying the type of compression, hours of compression, um, and all that too, to, so that we can kind of kind of hone in on that stuff as well. Right. 
Um, and so the other thing that we wanted to um, highlight is our upcoming symposium. Um, this year is going to be held on November 10th and 11th. And our um, agenda is really um, geared towards the lymphedema therapist. Um, we have a, a range of um, presenters and you can use this QR code or just go to Boston Lymphatic Symposium um, and check out the website. It has the whole agenda there. Um, and where it's going to be held at the Joseph B. Martin Center, which is really right near the, the Harvard Medical School, right near the VI campus on Louis Pasteur Avenue in Boston. So um, we hope to see you. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>